Uh, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Sebastian. Uh, I write uh, I write software sometimes. Mostly I break things. Uh, <clears throat> and I make lots of mistakes and and um, and that's what gives me the 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 reason to go and talk to people because I failed often enough to have something to say most of the time. If you want to chat with me, there's my email and my uh, Twitter handle on the first page. Uh, is everybody seeing the screen? Yep. Okay, cool. So there's very few slides. It's really just an intro discussion about um, where we are with the state of rest. <clears throat> the goal is to have a Q&A session. So those are just a couple of points of uh, of, uh, of introduction and after that uh, we can make the session however good or bad as we want it. Uh, knowing this is my first time doing a Q&A like this so uh, we'll see if it works <laughs> and then we'll learn from that and, uh, and we'll iterate. Um, <clears throat> so uh, rest, rest is not a new thing. Uh, Roy Fielding wrote the first thesis on it to, to model it, describe it, or document it, or just pass his PhD because he had to write about something. So he wrote about HTTP uh, 20 years ago. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's time flowing by quite quickly, but this was already, uh, already uh, a long time after the first browsers existed. This is a nice picture of NCSA Mosaic, which uh, some old timers may remember using back in the days. There was another mosaic that turned into Internet Explorer. Uh, interesting little story. Um, <clears throat> so really, the, 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 the difficulty with talking about REST has always been that uh, um, everybody has been using the term REST for a very long time, and it means absolutely everything to everyone. And you have a huge amount of continuous debates that that is trying to drag the definition of rest towards one direction or the other direction as if there was a a uh, a valid multi definition of uh, of the color red so that everybody could just say no this is red this is red this is red for whatever color you want to throw at it uh, <clears throat> rest is much simpler that we've uh, made it to be over the year and it has nothing to do with whatever people call it uh, rest is a way is the way that the web is modeled. I know it sounds uh, passe because I've been saying that in talks for 20 years, but if you think about how we build software today, especially in networked applications, things that go over the network, uh, we, uh, we, we already have one generic application, the web browser, is more or less allowing us to do anything we want across the whole internet with, uh, a lot of issues uh, and uh, and hairs being ripped out of heads uh, due to wonderful technology like CSS. But fundamentally, we've had a distributed set of computers that talk to one another in a completely distributed fashion, no central authority. And that's been going on on the web with graphic images, applications, and everything else using one browser over the last 20 years. Now you compare that to the amount of applications you write in your in your day-to-day -day job, specifically for each of the small things that you do, and you realize that there might be something to this idea that the architecture of the web is actually the longest running distributed system in the world that has ever been built and that hasn't completely crushed under its own weight. CompuServe, AOL, all those technologies, even MSN for the original MSN, they, they're all gone, right? So it's only the web that survived and the web flourishes uh, with its own issues, but technologically, it's 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 one of the most well enduring distributed systems in the world. <clears throat> but to understand what REST is, you need to understand that it's an architectural style. It's not a technology. I, I often get asked, or I used to often get asked, uh, if this call was RESTful or if this web website was RESTful. Why was this REST request not working? Or even hearing about a RESTful API. <clears throat> is an API really RESTful? Well, actually, it's the the it's it's the 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 architecture itself that is RESTful. What do we say when an architecture style? Uh, sorry, why, why do we say it's an architectural style and not a technology? It's because what defines REST, and I'll I'll get into it into a future slide. Is is how you model the things you're allowed to do 
so that you can rip benefits from reusing the same principles over and over again and gather some network effect on that. I'll get into that, but it's not a technology. It's not about HTTP. It's not about using JSON or not. It's not about using this or that HTTP method. Individually, those concerns are HTTP concerns. They may be interesting, but they have nothing to do with REST. They don't provide properties to how the system is built. They are, they are the plumbing, and REST has never been plumbing. But we'll also explain why if anyone asks me questions about REST versus something else, and that something else is a technology, I'll probably tell you it's a non sequitur, and then I'll probably still have about 10 or 15 minutes to say every single time. But you can't compare Apple to oranges. It doesn't matter if they use HTTP or not. It's completely irrelevant to REST. REST is based on constraints that we'll, we'll see in, in a minute. REST is also the description of a system that is not built for that piece of code that you want to ship out of the door this month and that you think you'll get rid of next month because, because as we all know, most code only, uh, only survives for the length of time we think it's going to survive. Um, so I'm, I'm piggybacking on the, the first part of the talk. Uh, 15 years is, uh, is a reasonable amount of time for code that was built for a month. We all know that code base. Uh, the reality is code bases and, and applications tend to last for a very long time. The architectures that we built for it don't. And so we end up having a huge amount of complexity to deal with because we, we built an infrastructure and an architecture for something that would only be the, for this month or maybe for this year and then we'll rewrite it later. And it never gets rewritten. And 15 years on, uh, you're still building the same thing. I mean, Open Rasta is an open source um, uh, web API framework, if you will, that I built 13 years ago and it's, it's still being developed. So code bases tend to last much longer than we envisioned. I didn't think I would be still coding the same open source projects 30 years on, to be honest. Uh, but the RESTful architecture is designed so that you create a distributed system that will last for years. That means that customers don't break, they can continue using your application. It may be a little bit iffy here and there, there may be degraded functionality here and there, but 10 years on, you can still go and take your modern browser on an old website, <coughs> sorry, and for the most part, take a very old browser on a new site with, with difficulty, but it's, it's doable. Uh, it's also created in a distributed environment. You can't have a distributed system with millions and billions of devices being connected and talking to one another if you're expected that the client and the server are being built at the same time by the same people using the same uh, specification that you just handcrafted for that specific application. Uh, we, we understand the difficulty of deploying anything to the desktop. I think uh, any app developer knows about that. Windows developers certainly know about the pain of installing and updating stuff on machines. Uh, the goal of clients and servers evolving independently is I can build new functionality in my distributed application and I don't have to go to each of my clients uh, going and rebuilding code that wasn't there before. So the role, the whole, the, the role of a RESTful architecture is also to ensure that clients and servers can evolve independently, that can be built independently with different technologies at different times, uh, and without having an interdependency on, I need this done here before I can do that there. We also have managed in a RESTful architecture to privilege a generic client, which is the browser for the web, uh, or an HTTP client for uh, developers that allows us to interact with that distributed system, reusing the same technology, the same code, the same frameworks, the same libraries over a wide variety of problems. That genericity is kind of ingrained in the existence of RESTful systems. If you had to create a new web browser for each website that existed, we would all have 500 browsers and they would all suck a little bit. Now, don't get me wrong with apps and iOS and, uh, and all, these, uh, all, these, all these applications that keep on being developed and they all do kind of the same thing. We, we did end up in that direction on mobile devices. Uh, not the greatest of, of places to be, but thankfully if I told you, let's just rebuild a custom branded browser uh, just for our site, you would not tolerate that. Uh, and yet, that's exactly how we did distributed systems before the web existed. So RESTful architectures are really about also making sure that uh, we don't reinvent the wheel every single time, unless a lot of marketing people think they have a good idea and then realize it wasn't a good idea. Uh, 
which happens a lot. RESTful architectures rely <coughs> on all these distributed systems working together in a way that privileges scalability of a raw performance. That's always been the principle of RESTful architectures is I'd rather optimize shipping the data closer to me and keeping it around than trying to be efficient about which would be one less field, which actually helps no one. Because a distributed systems with many network layers and many computers and many systems across the internet or across your organization, if you, if you work in a big organization, data that is close to you is quicker than data that is far from you. And so when there is a principle of trying to choose between scalability and performance, the internet has always chosen scalability. This is why it is what it is today, even though uh, it was designed mostly for caching data rather than trying to manage uh, distributed queries uh, like SQL did. Otherwise, SQL would be used as an integration platform between systems. And I think everybody would agree that's probably not a good idea. And finally, to be able to <clears throat> leverage all these things, everything that is in REST is standard-based. It's a fact that uh, too many cooks uh, in the kitchen seems to always be a bad idea, but in case of web standards, all the things that we use day in and day out, those standards allow the genericity of clients. They allow the interaction and the development uh, being independent from client and servers, and this requires wide industry approval. Many different people from many different companies agreeing together on how something is going to operate so that each of them can profit uh, while still interacting in using the same language for a specific piece of feature. That's very powerful. That means that you can choose uh, AWS Cognito or you can use Azure AD or you can use Auth0 and you'll still have the same authentication protocols behind the scene. It's not all perfect, but you know that there's a bunch of standards that people have agreed on. They've been adult about this. It's been uh, worked on technically interoperability problems have been ironed out. We have those technologies that are standard across the industry. And they've always been, uh, the, the whole of the web is based on this idea of standards, on this idea of interaction and making, making the greater good technologically uh, create, create a distributed systems. And that's also one of the things that RESTful architectures are, are really designed for. Um, but to understand, what it means for it to be an architecture in simpler terms. Uh, it's all about constraints. So uh, rest is defined by what you can't do rather than what you can do, uh, which has maybe triggered a whole bunch of, uh, of conversations that were sometimes less than positive. But the theory of constraint is, um, for example, uh, an interface, a C-sharp interface. You can have a C-sharp interface for every single type of collection. Uh, one for string dictionaries, one for int dictionaries, or you could have a generic interface for a key and value with T key, T value. We've seen dictionaries earlier. By specifying a generic set of methods on an interface, you're not providing more choice, you're reducing choice, right? You're saying, no, there will always be an add method and it will always take those two parameters. And if you want everybody to be able to use you because you look like a dictionary, however you are made, we'll reuse that same interface everywhere and you'll get the benefits of uh, the code that is built on that shared abstraction. Uh, it's, 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 it's called a uniform interface, I like the word universal interface. So I, I break from a normal lingo, but I think it's, it's much more grandiose as a title. Um, but um, we understand that completely. And you understand that over time, uh, reducing the choice, reducing your capacity to just invent new types and new methods allows uh, code to come behind it and start leveraging that common shared understanding of what a dictionary looks like. If you remember, iDictionary of T came in .NET 2, and then we had link that came on top of it. And then we had object constructors with index constructors and all those new syntaxes. Uh, all these things that we can do across all cross-cutting concerns about dictionaries because there's an interface called iDictionary of T, uh, or T key T value. If it didn't exist, everybody would be rebuilding their own collections all the time, and you would have to redo a lot of code, which I believe Go developers 
tend to uh, to do quite a bit. And certainly we used to do, before the generics implementation in .NET 2, we used to do that in C Sharp 1 quite a bit. So the universal interface in, 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 our, in uh, the architecture means that you have a set interface, a bunch of methods, it needs to look like this. You can only have operation X, Y, and Z. You can't create a new operation for every single little snowflake that you have for your object. You just have a get, you have a post, you have a put, you have a delete, you have a, you have a patch, you have a bunch of methods, and those methods have standard names, they are standard behaviors, they're published, everybody agrees on their definition, and you'll reuse them all the time. We don't use an internal ID as if your type was in a database, we use a URI. We have a uniform resource uh, identifier, we already have an ID. So we don't need an ID of four, we already have URIs for that, so we use that. I reduce choice, you always use a URI to identify a thing. That's one of the constraints. I use standard media types. <clears throat> you need to be able to communicate with that thing over a set of standard, standardly defined formats. And those formats need to be the JSON that's agreed over there and not handcrafted every single time you want to deal with an API. If you have to ship an IDL over into a piece of code to start communicating over, uh, you've, you've uh, reintroduced the coupling, you've reintroduced the little differences. So by removing choice, we're making the system simpler based on small little building blocks. And then we allow the whole of the infrastructure of a RESTful architecture to recombine all these bits together to make something better out of it. It's also client server, I've already covered that. It allows, <clears throat> by saying that it's client server, it means it's not a distributed system. There's not an even bus. There is a client talking to a server. It's request response. It's, it's one way of communication. By forcing client and server to only talk into a request response method, you can start um, evolving the client and the server differently. There's only one way of implementing things. You can replace the client, change the client, or change the server to another server, put another server behind the server. You can do a whole bunch of things because you're only allowed to communicate there and nowhere else and no, in no other different ways. So we can start evolving those systems independently. So I'm removing choice, which allows the system to, to build up. And it's layered. In a layered system, again, this is a constraint. You cannot know about too many uh, parties when you communicate in a RESTful uh, architecture. I talk to my application server. My application server may talk to a database, but that communication is layered behind the server. I have no idea. I have no way to know, and I do not want to know, and I'm forbidden to know from the constraint to know how the server implements its connection to the database. That allows me to replace the database I want to use or to dispatch it to another system or to dispatch it to another service and no one would ever know because my understanding as a client is only the next step. Each hop only knows the next one. This is a constraint I'm forbidden from knowing. The alternative would be to say, well, we can, we can, uh, you know that this service actually goes to SQL, so you start passing SQL information because you know the next hop goes to SQL. And then when you want to replace it to go somewhere else than SQL, well, all your SQL code has created a coupling that prevents you from doing so. So layering is also a constraint. It, it, it brings those benefits. The stateless concern uh, constraint is the, the one that is the most badly understood. Um, we prevent or <clears throat> The, the state of your application, the state of your program, typically on a computer, is its memory buffer, it's which, which text is in which field, and which step in its program it's in. All this information is, hit, is in the client. Yeah? And then every single time you want to do something, you go to the server, you exchange some bit of data, and you preserve in the client the rest of the information. We never said that servers need to not store state. That would be stupid. There's obviously state <coughs> in the server, otherwise there would be no application. But uh, the client does not, uh, the server does not keep client-specific state. Think about it in terms of having an SSH session, right? When you log into another box and the other box has your terminal and has your logins. That's a server that knows about you. You can't reconnect to another server because your session was open on box one and not box two. There's no way to share that. Uh, you end up with roaming profiles and crazy shit that can happen to try to transition them from one to the other. Um, this is in response to that. So the, the stateless constraint says, well, no, it's not for the server to know 
where the client is in its application uh, workflow. It, it's for the client to remember because the client is the one that's navigating each of those steps to go and do and purchase a, uh, uh, an airline ticket. And it allows horizontal scalability because once you stop having one server knowing specifically about one client, then the client can go to other servers. That allowed us to have all the tools that you already know, auto scaling, uh, firewalls, routers, and, and all this malarkey that are required by, by, uh, by stateless. And it's cacheable, I've already covered a little bit about this. Um, <clears throat> to make the system fast, you bring the data closer by keeping it cached, even if it means downloading more data than you need, because over time and over the whole network of applications, this will become more optimized. It's been true for the web for a very long time. It continues to be true, and it can be true inside your applications as well if you use caching correctly. <clears throat> but that means that you cannot have a system that is not cacheable. That's against what a against the constraint. The constraint is this shit needs to be cacheable. You need to be able to retrieve a thing. There needs to be a cache control header at the very least, and each of those resources need to have some caching instructions so that in a generic fashion across the network, everybody knows what application can cache what uh, in a completely transparent fashion. This allows you to have proxies and local caches and reverse proxies and all the infrastructure of the web that exists today and the infrastructure inside the corporate enterprise as well. So we prevent you from not doing caching. That allows the network effect of the system to work. Um, so that's been the last, the last 20 years of explaining RESTful architectures over and over again. The biggest change, of course, the biggest was new is we went from angle brackets to curly braces. Uh, that's, that's, that's about really all there has been <laughs> in the last 20 years. Um, the reason I'm talking about what, new, what is newish is if you look over the last 20 years, we've gone through um, needs by the industry that keep on being remet by new technologies. We started with XML and now we've moved uh, to JSON. We also have RDF for people that do data. Uh, that data model and JSON LD, which is one of my favorite formats. And with XML, people wanted to have schemas and validation. So XSDs were created, and RDF is a model which also have RDF schema in it. JSON schema is also a new schema language for JSON, it's not that new, but we keep on recreating those schema languages for each of the serializations across the web. Um, so the industry keeps on moving forward with, uh, with putting curly braces everywhere. Maybe a date time data type would have been nice. Uh, protocols, thanks to the network effects, the whole of the internet is consuming less and less bytes, right? And we have had nothing to do with it. My applications currently happily run behind a router and HTTP2 takes away a huge amount of the craft and the weight of those requests, optimizes connections, HTTP3 is in the pipeline, even more optimized using UDP and rebuilding streams on top of a non-reliable protocol. It's, it's absolutely fascinating what they do. And all this stuff, thanks to the constraints of RESTful architectures, this is the key, thanks to those constraints, thanks to the things we told developers they couldn't do, we can optimize the whole of the system uh, for everyone for free, or nearly for free. I and mean, I'm sure someone gets paid somewhere for something. I certainly pay for my AWS, uh, my AWS bills. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the default formats to describe APIs, this is where really the, the, the last 20 years have been very interesting because we started with trying to, we started with HTML and it was a very good hypermedia language, probably the best there was. Uh, you can go somewhere and it tells you how to create a UI and then you can fill in the data. It tells you where to send the data. It tells you how to react to when the data comes back and it's all driven by the server and the client was only built once and you just have to do pretty graphics, which is what the rest of the industry has been trying to do for machine to machine scenarios for the last 20 years. This is what RESTful APIs, if there is such a thing, have been about. They've been about, let's try to figure out if we can do what the browser does, but for code that is not the browser. So we started with things like AtomPub that allows you to deal with more or less collection of things. Um, more recently, each of those chunks of problems that we all have, we're starting to have industry-wide formats that means you don't need to try to figure out how to do error code management yourself. You want to have descriptions of something happening wrong 
there's a there's an RFC for that. We've got problem plus JSON. There's an XML serialization as well. So if you want to send error messages back, there's now a standard for that. One less thing that you need to design. Uh, health check documents when you want to do health checks and describe what's happening in them. There's also documents for that. And there's more generic formats that have been created to provide links so that we can provide the equivalent for a machine to those blue things you can click when you want to navigate the application without knowing in advance what it is because you want your code to be discovering what happens on this server and then put the same code to the other server and discover what that server is doing. All the way to open API, which is not as such a very good friend of, of uh, RESTful systems because it doesn't really understand hypermedia, uh, but is a widely used API uh, language description format. I would have put in there for completeness that open API is a little bit the wisdom of the day, unfortunately, and will probably end up with exactly the same disasters we had, but people who have their right click generate code, which has been plaguing our industry for 20 years. So we're back to that, so very sickly. JSON API is another format that I highly recommend you go and check out that also enables describing APIs that are based on JSON. And my favorite, because I'm an RDF semantic web um, kind of guy, is Hydra, which is kind of one of the most powerful and more complex uh, API language. Hopefully, all these things are hidden behind the tools you use, and we should be slowly but surely managing to have hypermedia clients that replaced the HTTP client from 20 years ago that we still use in .NET and in Java and all those terrible APIs that have implemented nothing interesting of HTTP because all the development has been done in the browser. People are very hard at work using those specifications to prevent you from having to build yet another client SDK for your customers or trying to generate code from a WSDL file or open API or Swagger before, when that was uh, called Swagger before. Even authentication has now been completely created uh, with standard systems. The way that Netflix logs in the first time and tells you you've got five recorded devices, OpenID Connect can create for you a new client ID on demand and it's all dynamic and you can point at any site and it can discover where to go to get tokens and what it supports. And there's a huge amount of work that has been done to make these things generic. Not as simple as the old HTTP authentication we used to have, but certainly something that uh, I really enjoy. <clears throat> and uh, HTTP continues evolving itself quite enormously. There is, uh, HTTP2 has changed a lot of things in, um, in the capacity we have to, um, to improve caching without sending everything down the wire all the time. Uh, I won't get into it. I did talks already about this. There's, there's plenty of people that have better blog posts about transclusions than I do. But HTTP status codes are not static. The, the uniform interface continues being developed. Uh, things like new redirects that define some more functionality. Uh, HTTP methods get added not very often because it's hard to get, to, well, the whole world to agree on what uh, method call on an API, it is, it's a bit complicated, uh, but patch is one that went through pretty quickly. We also have uh, new HTTP headers that are really starting to be developed to provide uh, better hypermedia support without having to put anything in the body. That's the link header. Uh, the prefer headers, which allow you to discover um, API functionality in real time and, say, and, and prefer certain behavior, like prefer sending more data so I can have more aggressive cache, or prefer sending me no new values when you render data, or, um, or um, prefer asynchronous communication. So I would rather you told me to come back later if it's going to take a while rather than just pend around. There's a whole bunch of, of uh, those things that are now standards, that are common problems in distributed systems, whichever distributed system you want to go over, as soon as you go over the network, those problematics are always the same ones, and these ones are standardized forwarded headers so that you can actually figure out who sent what when. Uh, there's, there's, quite, there's quite a huge amount of them uh, that exist today and continue existing. And uh, we talked about those a lot on, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm putting the Slack here, for httpapis.com, which is a, a Slack that talks only about HTTP APIs uh, in all its forms, has existed for quite a while. Most of the experts in the field out there were very, very privileged to have a lot of RFC writers and really cool guys. So <clears throat> if you want to discuss at length every single RFC that you can see, every single web standards, RESTful architectures, anything, most of the greatest brains in the industry 
uh, pass through from time to time. And for the rest of the time, I'm, I'm there. So <laughs> I can fill the void. Uh, that was just an intro of why I'm still fighting for REST, why I'm still building a RESTful library, uh, if we can call it that, a RESTful framework, whatever. Why I continue building REST systems, why I think there's still a huge amount of stuff that we're going to do and much, 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 much innovation coming in that space. So now, uh, I hope that triggers some questions, opinions, uh, disagreements, agreements, anything that you want. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm all ear. So how do we do this? Well, people can choose, I guess. Um, so you can unmute your mic if you want and ask questions or use the chat window, whatever everyone feels comfortable with. Silence. Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any? I got, I got one. I'm um, just wondering how, like, uh, like hypermedia as the engine of application state kind of goes with single page applications with you know React or Angular or whatever these days. Kind of like. <clears throat> so uh, it's it's a very interesting question. I think um, I think the biggest difficulty in some of the early SPAs is this this uh, and 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 in a lot of server side code as well is trying to implement a workflow. Uh, for an application in the server side, and then you re-implement exactly the same one in the client because you need to implement the screens and what happens when you click where. Well. And so if you want to, one of the reasons to adopt REST, and I, I recommend that you go and check uh, talks on, on vertical slices by uh, Jimmy Bogart, uh, because he has some examples on how to do this. But part of the idea of a single page application is that it it's already, it really has a huge amount of state. It keeps the state of views. However, when you delegate the decision, um, when, when you delegate the options to the server side, the server side can change the client behavior much more easily. So instead of re-implementing a specific implementation for each of your pages and do everything in React and then talk to the server as if it was an RPC call, and if you're gonna do that, just go RPC as much less noise, you're already very tightly coupled. Uh, what you can do is you say, well, by default, I'm going to allow any form to be displayed on the screen whenever the server tells me there's a form to fill in. I've got a user already, right? So I know that I've got an input and there's a name and the client is smart enough to say, well, it already knows your name because it has that state or it shows a text box. The buttons can be selected uh, or displayed because the server told you, well, here are the options. Here's a form and you can choose to do one of the many things that you want. And the client can dynamically activate or deactivate buttons if you already had some designs in it, or you can actually show the buttons based on what the server does. And then each time the server comes back with more requests for information, your application can start reacting to that more generic view of how the next step goes without trying to accumulate do all your screens and then do one big request to send it to the server. So when you want to do RESTful single page applications, you have to make the application a little bit dumber on a per screen basis to make it a little bit smarter and easier to modify so that I can deploy a new version of the server and it's the client that will follow um, the links that are provided by the server. So you need, you need, you need to pull it back up, uh, one level up. I suppose a follow-on question, are there any good sort of repositories around that sort of display good RESTful single page applications? Uh, I believe that Jimmy has one. Okay, cool. The .NET code base, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, live, I, live, you know, I live a little bit uh, in my bubble these days. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> so, bother me whether it's .NET or whatever, but just can you see that? Yeah, code. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, I think, I think I, I'll, try, I'll try to find the link. Oh, um, sweet, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll write it down and I'll send it over when I find it. Uh, well, I'll pop, in, I'll pop in my message and try to figure out and then I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll send it. Um, okay. Um, Sorry, if seeing as there's no other questions, I do have a kind of another one. I've been reading uh, REST in practice, and I, yeah. I, I kind of don't have my head entirely around this this hate the hateos concept. Um, it seems to me that 
uh, your client has to know all of the options that are potentially going to be available to it and how to re react to them. Um, how is, is that the correct kind of way of thinking about it or, or, or what? What's the... um, so, well, you already know everything that you need to know. It's whatever the browser does when you do plain old HTML. It's as simple as that. Um, it, it frankly is as simple as that. It's just, we, we create those level of complexities because we want to build um, basically what was forms applications and grids applications that we used to do in win forms back in the days. Um, the client can discover the options based on what the server tells us. It's exactly the same thing as HTML forms. You receive a form and there's a bunch of input type submit and you know which ones you're going to display to the customer because the server told you there's two buttons. It's, it's, it's completely driven by the server. So what you can, so this is a completely generic model. It's where you can do a single page application that just knows there's a form. Um, <clears throat> what you can do is customize each of those forms based on the kind of action it's supposed to be. That's what we do for our API. So you would say, well, if you give me a form and I have no idea how to present it, I'm just going to go to the default, put a bunch of text boxes and put a bunch of buttons because the server told me. I'll just follow whatever the server does. Uh, but if you know that this specific form is a create event form, your designers or yourself may have created a nice fancy page that inside your application already, or it's a specific module, or you know to open that one in a modal dialogue, or you have customized that special form. And then because the, the description of the form that the server tells you will say, oh, it's a create event form, you'll say, ah, but I know how to display that one nicer. So the client becomes smarter about understanding the context of how to fill in a form. The, the hypertext as the engine of application state for single page applications, I'm specifically talking about that, is, um, is purely that the actions, it's, it's for the clients to decide which step to take next. It's like when there's a, there's a treasure, treasure map games that we had as, as kids, right? You go to the next tree and then you open the little thing and it tells you what you, if you want the next, uh, the next tip, you go over there. So you become much smarter about doing UX correctly and knowing a bunch of actions, but the buttons that may or may not be there are only activated because the server tells you so. The difficult thing to understand is the switch from procedural thinking because the server may not tell you 200 okay, everything went fine because you submitted that form. It may tell you that it wants another form. You can't pre, as soon as you say, I'm going to send it to the server and I'm expecting this, answer and that answer will mean I go back to normal, then the, you've re-encoded the next step of the flow inside your client. So now the server tells you that you need to do this next, but the client is already implemented expecting only this. So you now have a tight coupling over multiple HTTP calls. And as a server developer, you can no longer make any changes. You can't say, for example, well, there was a form for create event, but actually because we don't really know that user, we're going to ask for, ask for a capture for example, because you're saying, well, my client code said, I'm going to send it and it's going to say 200, okay, I'll close the dialog, I'm happy. And I'll update my view. But actually the server may tell you, well, it was okay, but actually I, I just re-added another field and you need to type a code that you can't read because otherwise I won't let you pass through. That behavior, you can no longer do it driven by the server if the client has already built all these expectations. So you need to make the code a little bit more reactive. I've received a 200, okay, everything's done, or I received another form that I need to fill in and I need to continue displaying more forms until the server is content. Because when you provide that and you let the server decide what the next step is, show you the different steps that could happen, then the server can evolve and people on the server can start implementing new features without you continuously having to update your single page applications. Now, in all probability, people that do SPAs tend to have this very tightly coupled. I build, this, I build the API and I build the SPA and it kind of works like a, a monolith that's just distributed between HTML and the server. Uh, at that point, REST can still provide you with some benefits. Um, but I think, I think there's a huge amount of, of doubling down on the amount of work that you have to do because you need to keep two things in check all the time. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Matt is asking if REST is an architectural style. Can something like GraphQL API be made REST for? Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> no. <laughs> um, RESTful directly? No, it's very difficult for the simplest reason. Well, for two simple reasons. It breaks, it breaks, a, it breaks a bunch of things <clears throat> that, uh, it breaks some of the constraints actively, willfully. This is the reason for it to exist. First one is there is no global address, uh, address space. Each, each thing in GraphQL may have an internal ID that it shows there is no way to address things publicly. The formats that GraphQL uses for some things could probably be used over HTTP and made cacheable, uh, but there is no concept of a URI. There is no way to interact with each of those resources across a network. Uh, more importantly, I think they call them mutations. I can't remember what it was. I've not looked into it for a very long time, but um, the the interface that each GraphQL API is defined is is completely custom. It's custom pulled out of whatever the developer wants to put out. So it's in that respect very close to what SOAP Actions used to do, and very very far from uh, from what REST is. There is no way for me to logically know what I can do uh, from the various mutations in, uh, in GraphQL. It's not self-described. It's not universal across the whole internet. So every single time I interact with the GraphQL API, I need to relearn those specific things that are for that GraphQL API. So GraphQL APIs have the value they have, but, uh, but they don't have uh, the capacity to provide genericity, to provide tools that can be reused across multiple independent servers built by different people with different mental models. Because there is no constraint on naming methods and naming mutations. There is no constraint on identification. There is some constraint in formats, which is nice. Uh, but uh, the rest, could it be made it? Um, I don't know. It seems that a lot of middleware vendors are very happy to sell you caching middleware now for GraphQL. So that tells you that uh, that uh, <clears throat> that that tells you that they had to rebuild a whole set of infrastructure to sell you tools uh, for a problem that is pretty much uh, understood by now, because there is no visibility, there's no uniform interface, there is no cacheability by default, and they're investing a huge amount of money to try to rebuild it. So uh, the benefits are these ones. Uh, on the other hand, because you are much more RPC style or custom snowflaked per API for, for GraphQL, you get, uh, you get a little bit less data being returned because you can choose your fields. So I think it's, it's GitHub's obsession. I don't think it's, it was valid. There's other ways to solve that in an HTTP and caching friendly way. So you lose caching and then you get two less fields. Uh, but fundamentally, just tell a DBA that you go, you're going to open a cross table joins for for arbitrary large queries on their SQL server from any developer and they may get a little bit anxious and GraphQL for me feels a bit the same. So uh, you don't get the caching because you have too much freedom and it's then very difficult to build that freedom. Um, after that, you know, it's another tool in the toolbox. Um, so there's a couple of questions about OData. Uh, OData, uh, yes. I don't dislike it as much as I used to. I still think that uh, it's close to impossible to implement in an independent manner. One of the one of the difficulties with those specifications, they are really complex, they are really tied to the data model behind them. Uh, if there are no large numbers of open source implementations, and if it's not easy to get to when you require a development team of 40 people to implement a spec, chances are a middleware vendor is trying to sell you something. That was the state of our data a long time ago. They did try to do the best they could with the uh, uh, with keeping in rest, but implementing a no data provider to this day continues to be close to impossible for most common mortals, including large organizations that sell developer tools that are not Microsoft. So I'm not keen on no data, but at least they got some of the concepts right. It's just the querying is a bit of a nightmare. and and uh, But they, they, they do embrace HTTP technologies a lot more. They, they embrace the prefer header, um, there's URIs, uh, it's better than GraphQL, but it's still hard as hell to implement. So I, I stay away from it too. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I ask a really basic REST question? 
Sure. This is um, this is this is a much lower level than, than than everything that goes before. But um, in when I feel so, my experience of rest is is as something that's being built directly as a back end to a spa or the like. And in that scenario, I feel like I always end up with the situation where I either have to make the compromise between having a, a kind of very clearly defined API where I kind of have an end point per object. So an end point for a customer, an end point for a sales order, say. Um, or, but if, I, if I'm trying to hydrate a page with a, with a mix of data, you know, so a customer with all their orders and you know, kind of all of this related data, then now I end up with kind of variants of my REST endpoints that are different pages that show different views of this roughly the same data, you know, so a kind of customer overview versus a customer with their orders versus customer with, you know, this kind of thing. And you end up with this, I think, I feel like that's where the desire for GraphQL came from because you're, you're, you end up just rewriting, rewriting your REST API, your REST API in order to meet the needs of your, and it only exists to hydrate your your page. And and maybe maybe really REST is the wrong tool for the back end of a spa. I don't know. What 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 are your thoughts on that kind of thing? So, <clears throat> so there's 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 a couple of things there. Uh, the first one from a purely technical basis, um, it's again the choice of scalability and cacheability versus performance. This is really the problem. So to make it simple, you retrieve a list of customers, there's 500 of them, and you retrieve a list of customers and all their orders, uh, which is an N plus one problem. Problem is, if you have those two endpoints, they become two different cache keys, so you can't cache them independently. And every single time you want a new expansion, you can't hit the cache key, so you go back to the database. It's not locally on the the, the sites that you're doing. You've lo you've lost caching completely by by having those variants, and that requires you a huge amount of of manual uh, manual messing about, which is what OData was solving with a URI. Um, querying back then and the expand dollar expand or whatever it was. Um, so those problems that GraphQL are, are solving have always been a sort of a client server tightly coupled API. I just want the data in that specific shape uh, kind of problem. Uh, but they make caching apps, they, they, they forego caching and the capacity to cache completely to allow for this slightly uh, smaller subset to come back. The difficulty is that the tooling has been has not been built by people to get the caching uh, until now. So you needed to choose if you wanted to expand or not expand. HTTP2 has introduced a whole bunch of changes with that because we can now say, well, send me the list of customers and also for those customers, I want all the orders. But it's going to send you what I, what I call HTTP2 promises. And they allow you to retrieve all those documents in one go plus the HTTP2 protocol being as fast as it is, by the time you get to your end list of customers, you've already received all the other things. Uh, so there's a couple of efforts to make sure, basically you send one request and you get 12 documents back and they all send in parallel down the same TCP connection. You maximize your throughput of, uh, enormously. Uh, those are really powerful technologies we've built with, with uh, I remember being at the HTTP working group uh, with, the, with the browser vendors. They, 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 they have implemented that extra level of cache in the browser today. So you have this level of cache where you can pre-cache all this data that comes down. So <clears throat> there, is, there, is, there, there, there are those technical plumbing issues that we didn't have good solutions for really until now. But all this depends on having a good cache. Because frankly, you only, you don't, you, the, the problem is for the infrastructure, for us to use the cache efficiently, it needs to be used. <laughs> I know that's stupid, but uh, if we don't have an HTTP cache, we keep, we keep on retrieving the customer list all the time. Um, we can't do conditional gets. So I can't figure out very quickly if I have new customers. Because my list of customers might give you a not modified, but now if I put the orders, suddenly it's modified. So I need to re-retrieve everything. So the identification of each of these things independently and their orders independently and having cache control, uh, that requires you to have a local cache. When you don't, then you load all this stuff up in memory and then you have your own cache. So you've got your application cache that's there and your HTTP cache and the other cache and you've got four levels of cache and no one can cache anything, which might also be another reason why GraphQL exists. So those technologies exist in the browser. Uh, vendors like Microsoft and, and nearly everyone else has been 
really, really bad at pushing this stuff. So people have been deploying their own cache quite successfully at the HTTP level and have just stopped doing object level caching. Because once you, once you know that your machine can do distributed caching, you don't, you don't keep the object in cache if you don't have to. People doing MVVM may, may, uh, may have issues because you have to have object instances. But um, so, so for the caching thing, HTTP2, transclusions, prefer headers, HTTP push, all these technologies are there to, uh, to start filling the cache before you can even realize. I think there's a second, uh, there's a sec second problem to that also, which we, and I understand, I understand that not all tools are created equal, um, but I don't see anyone, I'll be very honest, I never see anyone moaning about the average web pages being close to 20 meg now. And sometimes I feel that the desire to, um, because, because mostly you load them once and then after that a lot of it's cached, right? And designers and developers are used to making sure that things are absolutely cacheable. But when I reach people saying, oh, REST is dead, it's usually people say, you don't need caching, caching is horrible. But it's the same people that go and get a page rank on their page and figure out how to make caching work better. So I think there's, I think there's also, it depends on your application, but for client facing applications, downloading 15 meg is not actually a problem. It's never been really a problem. It, it can become a bit of an obsession or compulsive problem uh, because very often if you have caching, you don't have the visibility, uh, the, the, the user facing visibility of the problem. If you don't have caching, yeah, it's horrible. But you, replay, you, you either have the local cache or you have efficient querying, but you can't really have both. <laughs> you, have, you have to choose. It's a, there's no right answer between the two, frankly. Um, but I, I think you touched on another interesting point, which is that um, we have a very dysfunctional industry, just in general. And the, our need to try to have those APIs that are well-defined with scenarios that are completely generic for all applications is kind of not what REST does. REST doesn't really care about having one, one set of nice, clean resources. It, it kind of tries on the contrary to say, well, if you want an endpoint to look and behave differently, just create a new endpoint. It's cheap. It's actually the one part of the RESTful architecture that is cheap is to create a new resource. Now we've not done that because we have this artificial separation between front end and, and back end, where back end developers live in their world with their own schedule and the front end developer lives in their world with their schedule. And so they build a generic API that everybody will be able to use whatever the scenario and the other ones have scenarios and they can't fulfill them, but now, now they don't talk to one another and no one wants to create yet another uh, endpoint. But if you think about how you just normally just do an extra page in an MVC app, we already do that all the time, create a new endpoint because there's a new scenario and we don't even think about it, but we don't do it for APIs, even though an API and a page, a web page is actually, from a RESTful perspective, it's the same thing. They're the same concept, but we don't treat them. We, we, want to, uh, we want to treat our resources more like pets rather than cattle. And uh, that's because we interact with them in a way where we have the documentation with a bunch of URI templates, they need to look cute, and then we describe what they do underneath, and it needs to look cute. Whereas when you, when you go really fully RESTful, you understand that what's important is actually the media type definition. It's, uh, this is what a form looks like. This is how you navigate links. This is why you do them. This is where the button appears or disappears based on this content not being there. And after that, no one will ever see the URI templates, and that problem goes away because no one knows they're there. Just like when you're in a browser, you don't really know. Uh, you're just in a page. You click on the button, you're on a new page. You fill in a form, something happens. You give your credit card number, you've got a product. Amazon arrives two days later. Uh, if it, RESTful APIs are fully RESTful, uh, which touches a little bit is ATOS mandatory for an API to be RESTful absolutely because of this specific problem. Um, if you don't have hyperlinks and forms and dynamic form support, you do not have a way to hide away what resources exist and how they interact with one another because this is supposed to be server driven. But things like open API and swagger before it and publishing URI templates and the old RESTful APIs like GitHub version three or whatever with URI templates that I'll describe, they're actually trying to document an API we should use with this at the wrong level. It describes an interactive, an interaction with an API. You call this, you'll get back that. For one call and that's it instead of, of telling you that there's a workflow to follow. 
that is much more generic than just this specific API. So actually, yeah, it's an, it's annoying to build a new uh, a new endpoint specifically for a scenario, but it's actually usually the most efficient way to do it. And the biggest problem we have with all those queries like GraphQL, uh, which is in itself is not a bad technology, but um, you just push the problem one further away, right? You have one scenario is not fulfilled by APIs. Now you have a GraphQL thing that goes to four different APIs to pull the data and does some sort of magic aggregation, and then it comes back. And now you have a second performance problem. It's just like opening, you know, SQL to SQL straight from a from the web browser. Let's just do a, a join on twelve tables because that's exactly what the web dev does uh, need at that point. It's it's a little bit. You've not really solved the problem architecturally. You've just moved it one step further because now the client dev is happy. He can do his query and it's going to do magic. And the server guy has not been asked to change his plan, so he's happy. <laughs> But someone's not going to be happy in the middle of it because there's no magic. You can't make you can't make electrons go any faster. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, no. It does. I think there's a there's a lot that there's a lot of a lot has happened in REST. I think since the since I since I really looked at it in detail from what you're saying, it's um it's the, the kind of dynamic aspect of it is something that I'm not at all clued in on. It's definitely an item. Well, I think I think we are missing we are missing a, we are missing a lot of implementation work. Um, the big vendors are are finding the next shiny thing to chase and the next middleware product to sell. So. <laughs> they don't really go back to to building the basics. I think the other the other guys actually care. The guys that really care about building the basics right are the browser vendors. Uh, the people that just do HTTP frameworks don't on the client don't seem to be under a lot of will so far to do better, to have proper caching. I mean, WinForm, Windows applications have not done HTTP caching since WinInet days. This is how bad this is. There's not been a local HTTP cache for any .NET application for years. And uh, that, that I've not been told that this was on the books because people now are chasing GraphQL. But they chose, they ch they changed their data before, so it's, it's a little bit like the RTF XSD thing. It's, it's, it's cyclic. In five years, there'll, there'll be a new tool that uh, solves all problems, and I'll still be doing rest talks. <laughs> I think. I guess there's a lot about the um, education side as well because. Um, I guess most people think of REST and just think about just get post, put, delete, that kind of thing, and not realize all the other stuff that comes along as well, like I like we mentioned HATOS before and all this kind of stuff. So just uh, but, yeah. people probably don't, don't even know it exists, I guess. I think, I think it's, it's, it's always been a very difficult one because um, uh, well, I, think, I think part of the REST community has just gone tired of, of talking about implementation details of HTTP and uh, for people that have gone and done it, we, we live in a happy world where we can change stuff very easily um, by having very small modular architectural components and then do crazy things. Um, one day I'll do a talk about what we do at WenFresh with uh, RESTful layered ar architectures. Uh, but uh, for example, metrics are aggregated by a reverse proxy that no one knows is there. That way, there's only one reason for the for for a service to change, and it's not metrics. Uh, that's the kind of things that we can do because we we apply the constraints, and the constraints mean me telling a developer, no, you can't do that because you break X. But I but we've been we've been very good at people saying don't do that, but we've not been very good at explaining them why. So the vendors are not giving us as many tools as we should have because they're not diverting the money where I believe it should go. And we've not very, because of that, to a certain extent, all the cool tooling that we can build to really make this uh, network effect uh, happen in terms of, of architectural investment, uh, we, we've not been able to show it in public because I'm not launching a new open source project. I, I, I don't want it anymore, <laughs> uh, but we should. Um, so there is a question on uh, thoughts on open uh, API and WSDL. I think I've covered this a little bit. If you feel like I've not covered it enough, if you generate code that implements all the interaction inside one piece of code, you've re-implemented 
all the behavior in your client, just like you did in the server, you don't let the server tell you what the next steps are. So you, you, you don't allow the server to evolve independently. That's why I don't like code generation in that way. I think it breaks stuff. It can be made to not be horrible, but it stays reasonably horrible, I think, over time. The benefits of all this stuff and reuse and genericity and serendipity is over years, it's not over months. So if you're just there to do one project for two months, you think you're going to save time, but you have 12 projects a year and you stay in a company for four years and your view starts shifting a little bit because you don't want to maintain all this stuff anymore. That's my open API and wisdom. Um, are the endpoints responsible for the presentation logic? Um, the server is responsible for telling you what are the next steps or what next steps are available. It's for the client to choose which one, but it's the server that tells you what happens next. In HTML, this is a presentation. Uh, layer if you will i don't i don't know if a form tag is really presentation there are inputs there's in i mean if you think about it the web the browser renders an input type called text as a text box but actually it's just telling you i need a field that is of type text so it's it's not necessarily presentational as such it it, it can be logical it can create uh, things like schema.org actions uh for example create event action uh, that will tell you all the fields that are required at that point. Be it's it's not, it can be functional rather than or logical rather than just presentational. Uh, but there's usually quite a good mapping between a, a task-based UX and um, and forms or actions that you want the client to generate for the server. Even if there's no UX, we use forms to uh, let an API client connect to the API, discover what is available and choose which of the options it gets given based on what it knows about the current state of the system. So I have a create event. I know it's on the, it's in June. So I need, I, there's a description that says that I go to that service to do it. I follow and do it because I know that event will be for June. If it was for July, I would go to another service my client knows it goes to the to june so it's 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 a client that is running with absolutely no ux um the the fact that you have links and forms is not necessarily related to ux they translate as nice forms uh, in a browser and nice blue hyperlinks in a browser but they don't need to translate as that in code uh Matt, you asked, is, isn't that breaking separation of concerns? I'm not entirely sure uh, if it's related to presentation logic. Um, but uh, in the case of, do you need to create, so. So, sorry, Sebastian, the, my, my comment was more about the comment above, that the, the endpoint shouldn't be returning markup and, and presentation logic. It, to me, it's returning information. And, and and as you say, kind of what the next step might be, but it's not going to tell my consumer what it's supposed to be displaying to a customer. So, so that question of should there be a separate endpoint for mobile and a web app for, uh, let's say, getting a customer? No, there shouldn't. Like a customer is a customer. That's what it is. It, it's not a customer, but, oh, hang on, I'll, I'll give you some markup here or I'll give you something to display it differently on a mobile application. So, yeah, I, it's, it depends. I mean, we, we are used to do that. If, again, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go back to what I was saying where I don't consider the existence of a web page any different from the existence of an APR. There are two resources over HTTP. I consider them to be part of the RESTful, uh, the RESTful interface. We used to do, um, before we had reactive sites, we used to have a mobile site that had a different flow uh, between the client and the web pages that were sent to the client and the desktop site. And there were good reasons for it is because it worked and <laughs> we had no other tool to do it properly. So now we have JavaScript and CSS and, and, uh, and reactive designs and media queries and a whole bunch of stuff that allow us to say, no, actually there's just, here's the information I need to figure out how to display it. And by the way, I also send you how to display it separately as a CSS file. So, you know, the client still decides if it wants to or not. It, there is a separation of concern between the information that you fill in and the styling. And I think the old or well, people that used to be in web dev uh, at the very beginning of HTML remember when CSS came out because it was that separation of concern between how mm -hmm. we present stuff and how we collect the data. 
Um, so it's not clear cut because the interaction between the client and the server when your little mobile app is, is retrieving HTML pages over WAP, if they still remember that kind of stuff, uh, had to be different by definition, but the interaction was still pretty restful using one standard, which was WAP, uh, or compact HTML back in the days. Um, it's no different than having an API that is more chatty and having a separate set of endpoints that is more bulky because you've identified that there's multiple scenarios. There's only so much magic we can do by creating interfaces by definition. Uh, when the interface doesn't fit, we start suffering too much by trying to shove a, a, a round, uh, what is it, a square peg in a round hole or so I, I don't remember the English term for that. So building, building yourself a different endpoint might be more functional, but it might only serve a certain category of clients as well. That's also possible. So I'm, I agree with you. The, the presentation logic is a different thing from telling the clients that you require certain fields and letting it display it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. fundamentally, sometimes there's a one-to-one -one mapping because HTML, and it's not that, it's not that much of a problem. Uh, in, in, in practice. Where we would have a problem is if the server told you you need to display uh, a rectangular box here and you, when you press a button, then you have to display a font uh, character letter F when you press the F keyboard. That, that's display presentation logic that's best dealt by your graphic driver and Windows. Um, but even that goes over message loop in Windows applications, right? So the, the distinction between the two is not always clear cut. Um, but I think now that reactive things have changed, I think, I think, the, the, I think that doesn't uh, exist as much anymore as a problem because we don't have those specific gateways. But fundamentally, what you're going to do, you know, you're going to have a compact site and you've got, you've got the desktop site and you want to use exactly the same API, even though the interaction scenario is different, it becomes, it becomes iffy. It becomes iffy. Yeah, I mean, I mean so more, my, my experience certainly more recently has been that the minute you try to retrieve any kind of presentation logic from an endpoint because yeah, i mean I, I work primarily in web stuff so we kind of do have two layers and i totally get what you're saying about the difference between an api and a web page is is minimal you know they they are effectively doing the same thing but we tend to have a page and then the page will consume uh, another endpoint for the data uh, with the restful api but also we'll have a server consuming that same api that there is no presentation there. It's maybe just doing something else or, or processing data as part of a scheduled task. And at no point do you want the response from, from the, um, the API to be, ta-da, here's some HTML, because that's kind of what you're going to want to render. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't want HTML. I want to know what the data is. I want you to tell me what the data is. And I want you to tell me what I need to do with it, perhaps. But don't tell me how I want to show it, because... I might be an example <clears throat> app, I might be a web forms, uh, let's, let's screw it, I'm a WASP application, brilliant, lovely. All these kind of things that you kind of could be, that, that one API that stops you having to write various different versions of it if you're just getting back a very neat kind of vanilla data representation. It's, it's, there's a, there's a huge amount of, in, of interesting things that could, that uh, could be discussed on this. I remember specifically building a, an API uh, at a large uh, bank that, uh, that's in Canary Wharf across two organizations in the company that were not more or less able to use the same systems because one, but it's, it's financial. So, you know, there's parts of the company that are not allowed to touch each other's systems. But we decided it was silly because we were all doing the same stuff over and over again. So why don't we just build one standard way of displaying book information? The API was an XHTML table. The client was a WinForms app. The data model for XHTML is not necessarily bad. It's, it's, it was tables, there was headers and rows and data, and then we annotated with microdata some more stuff. And it was, it was perfectly fine. And if you went there with a browser, you didn't have to read any JSON. It was just an HTML table. But the, the, the WinForms application was displaying a grid, an HTML table and a grid that kind of match made in heaven. <laughs> they, they just work. So you have Telerik consuming XHTML over an API. I mean, and it was two different implementations. It was the same implementation of the code going to do two different data sets. And the, uh, you pre-configured the, the, the WinForms control, you pointed it to a website, it would discover 
uh, which one you were using, and you didn't care about where the source of the data was. So presentation layer, it's, it's you, you, can, you can feel free to ignore a lot of the presentation things because some of the markups that we used to use around XHTML can be powerful enough for your scenarios. And actually they integrate nicer. So because, because those technologies tend to be separate between HTML and non-HTML and, and CSS these days, it's easier to actually return HTML and do something useful. That was before HTML5, now it's on processable mess and there's no good tool in for it. So I don't touch it anymore, but for XHTML it worked well. Um, uh, maybe I'll take the question from Matt about RESTful versions very quickly. Um, uh, was it, I don't know, so, oh, there was, no, from Ian Johnson. Oh, hello, Ian. Uh, been a while. Um, so REST interaction with clients and server can survive version change, but I have to, yes. Uh, I think, I think versioning is, uh, is versioning, the, I've got a whole talk on versions, uh, version, versions are evil. I've, I've given you the lowdown of the talk. So go and check out on how versioning is wrong, mostly for distributed applications, maybe all the time. Um, but with, 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 with all the things I've explained to you, the, the simple fact that RESTful applications are designed to run for five years without breaking the clients of your API, creating an independent and compatible version numbers is, is uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to tell my customers to go and rewrite their code for no benefit. So we don't version, I don't like versions. They break the web enormously and they break RESTful architectures in millions of small different ways. And you will lose the, you will lose the network effect if you start doing versioning. Because every work you've done to pull that network effect, that generalization of code, those new Lego blocks and making sure that over time your infrastructure can become smarter, you have to redo it all every single time you change versions. I'm not a big friend. Feel free to look at the talk and ask me questions about it. It's one of my pet, pet subjects, as Ian Johnson know anyway, because I'm pretty sure he went to that, to that talk once uh, upon a time. Um, do, do we still have time to take, uh, Matt, Matt was asking, uh, uh, what learning resources should I use to start filling those gaps? I really highly recommend the HTTP API uh, Slack. Um, there are links continuously, uh, weekly, about uh, new resources, and and uh, Phil Sturgeon is doing. Uh, I think it's Phil. Phil Sturgeon uh, has a great blog. There's a bunch of people that have very very good blogs, but I, I I should create a master list. But frankly, those links keep on popping up on HTTP APIs. It's a non-commercial, non-book related, non-technology related, no company related or group related. It's purely just people talking HTTP. Uh, there's a huge amount of content in there and you'll find massive amounts of links from, uh, from, uh, from people that really know what they're talking about and make me feel stupid on a daily basis, which I really like. That and them and my mother are the two uh, two groups. <laughs>